Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. I see the number is kind of, well, it's still going up. Um, but we'll we'll get started anyway with a brief introduction. So uh, welcome everyone to our final day of CLAPS. I'm excited that we have our lightning talks to start us off today. Um, we'll have nine presentations. They'll be no more than 10 minutes each. And feel free to submit questions um, that are general or directed at um, you know, a specific lightning talk presenter using the Q&A feature. And we'll get to those at the end of um, once everyone's had a chance to present. And um, let's see what else housekeeping. So Sh Cheryl will be um, keeping time and keeping track of questions and the presenters will be introducing themselves. So we'll let them get started. And I think I'm still seeing people enter the room. So maybe, all right, well, let's go ahead and get started. So I'm gonna hand it over to the first Lightning Talk presenter and stop sharing my screen and we'll get started. Hey everyone, I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Um, hello everyone, uh, thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm happy to present my presentation um, on the Hidden Curriculum and hetero Heteronormativity in Library Instruction. Uh, my name is Thomas Weeks and my pronouns are he, him. I am an instruction librarian at Augusta University in Augusta, Georgia, as well as a doctoral candidate in Cultural Curriculum Studies. Um, my doctoral work has been around queer youth studies and popular culture as cultural politics. Um, I have been eager to include these ideas I've been exploring in my doctoral work um, into my work as a librarian, um, which was really the genesis of this particular line of inquiry. Um, I first used the construct I am presenting about today, the hidden curriculum of heteronormativity um, for understanding open educational resources um, in a book chapter for an ACRL publication, which I will be linking in my references today, so you can definitely check that out. Um, I am presenting today um, from the ancestral lands of the Muscogee and Cherokee peoples um, who were forcibly removed by the United States government. Um, so we first need to explore what I mean by the hidden curriculum. A key question for understanding the hidden curriculum is whose knowledge is being taught and why? The hidden curriculum comes out of curriculum theory which understands that schools function primarily to organize social relations around hegemonic ideology. In other words, education acts as a function of our social world to teach students, quote unquote, how the world works, but tends to privilege those with power and their dominant visions of the social world. Uh, Peter McLaren, a renowned theorist of critical pedagogy, who some of you may be familiar with, um, states that the hidden curriculum is the unintended outcomes of the schooling process that benefit dominant groups and exclude subordinate ones. The hidden curriculum is all those messages sent by our teaching and the educational structures that our teaching take place in that aren't necessarily explicit, but happen anyway because education is by default a function of organizing social power in specific ways. When we teach, we reproduce this knowledge whether we intend to or not. As part of the educational structure, library instruction is involved in the hidden curriculum. The second part of my construct is heteronormativity, which was first introduced by queer theorist Michael Warner in the early 90s. It is the organization of the social world that privileges heterosexuality and cisgender identities and the associated assumptions about the world that go along with this privilege. As theorist Gus Jeff explains, when the view is that institutionalized heterosexuality constitutes the standard for legitimate, authentic, prescriptive, and ruling social, cultural, and sexual arrangements, it becomes heteronormativity. 
We must remember, as this quote demonstrates, that this isn't always about just sexual arrangements. For example, we can analyze the idea of single family home ownership as a heteronormative construct. Home ownership is premised on the idea of the nuclear family and is meant to strengthen the social and economic bonds of that nuclear heterosexual family. That isn't saying that everyone who owns a home is homophobic, but that it's privileged status in our cultural imaginary. And this is a function of the ideological power of heteronormativity. So what do I mean when I say the hidden curriculum of heteronormativity? It is a construct that combines the ideas of the hidden curriculum and the heter and heteronormativity that I just talked about. In other words, heteronormative ideas can be and are reproduced intentionally or unintentionally by our educational systems, acting within the hidden curriculum to privilege dominant knowledge paradigms. Again, this doesn't just mean information about queer people, but structures that privilege heteronormative ideas about the world. For example, history textbooks may present knowledge as settled facts while leaving out history which contradicts dominant narratives. It positions its contents as authoritative, as an authoritative source with authority being a patriarchal idea of power that totalizes knowledge but leaves out much of the historical record. Again, we come back to our key question, whose knowledge is it and why? When we're talking about the hidden curriculum of heteronormativity, we're talking about knowledge that is primarily white, heterosexual, cisgender male, and middle-class view of the world. The message this sends is that other voices and historical narratives are not authoritative enough to be included in the official narrative. Many different pedagogies have emerged as ways to counteract the hidden curriculum, such as critical pedagogies, feminist pedagogies, critical race pedagogies, etc. But the one that I want to focus on is queer pedagogy. So what is queer pedagogy? According to the originators of queer pedagogy, Mary Bryson and Susan de Castell, it is a teaching against the grain or an amalgam of performative acts in fleshing a radical form of what we envision to be potentially liberatory enactments of gender treachery within the always already heterosexually coded spaces of education. Queer pedagogy allows us to speak the unspeakable as Deborah Britzman says, Britzman also explains that a queer pedagogy is more than just the inclusion of certain voices because inclusion functions as a way to normalize discourse. In other words, to create space for people within hegemonic discourses, not counter those discourses altogether. As Britzman explains, queer pedagogy offers education techniques to make sense of and remark upon what it dismisses or cannot bear to know. Queer pedagogy offers us a way to rethink the ways dominant discourses shape both us as teachers and what it is we teach, a way to rethink and challenge the normalizing practices that affect both the object of education and the educator, that is us. When we talk about the hidden curriculum of heteronormativity in library instruction, we need to think about the structures that inform how we think of information literacy both its practice and the ways that we teach it. I want to refer back here to the idea of authority. Much of the work of library instruction is built around ideas about authority, whether we explicitly say this or not. Things like credibility, peer review, good sources, and many others of these standards for quality are tied up in these heteronormative knowledge practices. That is, there are people who know something and you should believe them because of their privileged status. They are the arbiters of what is true, and we exclude other ways of knowing and being. Our, teacher, our teaching in the information literacy classroom is generally centered around such. We inculcate students in the belief that if they follow a certain set of informational practices, they will become this thing that we call information literate. However, we can work against this hidden curriculum of library instruction by starting to think through the lens of queer pedagogy in the library classroom. By rejecting dominant discourses of power and authority, 
we can begin to rethink the ways we can queer the library instruction classroom. This work is still in process for me. I'm still thinking through these initial foundational ideas. Um, so I don't currently have answers for how we do this, um, but I look forward to working more on this and also discussing this more with you all in the future. Thank you. And these are some of my references. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for coming to my talk on um, uh, fatness, fat liberation, and instruction. My name is Liz Shenevy. My pronouns are she, her, and I am a health and behavioral studies librarian at James Madison University, uh, which sits on the land of the indigenous Siouan, Algonquian, and Haudenosaunee communities who lived here for many generations and continue to be systematically erased by policies and practices that remove their histories from this place. To provide some context as to where I'm coming from, I am a white, straight, cisgender woman. For the majority of my life, I have been thin, but in the last several years, especially since carrying and birthing a child, my body has grown larger, and the way that my body holds fat causes me to fluctuate between straight sizes, which are typically sizes up to a U.S. women's 14, and plus sizes, which are U.S. women's 14 or 16 and up. As fatness is a spectrum, I sit at the lesser end and therefore still experience a good deal of thin privilege. I can find clothes that fit me in mainstream stores more readily than those with larger bodies can. While I have experienced weight shaming from doctors, this has not kept me from receiving attention and diagnoses when needed. I do not have to worry about furniture weight capacities. I can fly in airplanes without buying an extra seat or being forced to contort my body to fit into the increasingly shrinking seat size. I have not experienced weight discrimination from my employer. I do not fear my weight being used against me in a family court. In general, fatness does not adversely affect many aspects of my day-to-day -day life. So why am I talking to you about fatness today? In fat activist Aubrey Gordon's book, What We Don't Talk About When We Talk About Fat, she calls on straight-sized people to participate in fat liberation. She writes, straight-sized people will need to resist the urge to reject fat experiences out of hand because of a lack of context. Instead, they'll need to find the context. They'll need to look harder to sharpen their vision, They'll need to learn to see anti-fatness everywhere because it is. Anti-fatness uh, may not make sense to straight-sized people. It doesn't make sense to me either. But straight-sized people's tasks will be threefold. Not to buckle under the weight of their own discomfort, to stay in the conversation long enough to learn, and to take proactive action to counter anti-fat bias and help defend fat people. As someone on the small end of the fatness spectrum and who has been thin for most of my life, I find this call helpful as I continue to navigate my own body, its privileges, and how I move through a world ripe with diet culture and anti-fatness. It's a messy process and I'm sure that I make mistakes. But fat liberation requires vulnerability and criticality from all of us, and so I'm here attempting to show up even if it's imperfect. While I've been doing the personal work of deconstructing my own anti-fat bias and better understanding and working towards fat liberation, I have found myself asking, where is this conversation in libraries? As many of us have embraced critical practices discussing issues of race, sex, gender, class, and ability, and oftentimes their intersections, fatness is noticeably missing. While the academic fields of fat studies and subsequently fat pedagogy have been growing for the past several decades, in the library literature, I have only found three articles that explicitly discuss fatness. This lightning talk serves as a very initial exploration for myself into how fat, pe fat pedagogy might inform my information literacy instruction as one means of working towards fat liberation. Fat pedagogy provides a framework within which to critically consider how fatness shows up in our learning spaces, how we talk about it, how we research it, and how that knowledge is reproduced. Let's begin with fat pedagogy generally, which stems from the fields of fat studies and critical pedagogies and aims to disrupt anti-fat bias through educational means. In their chapter, Fattening Education, an invitation to the nascent field of fat pedagogy, Aaron Cameron and Constance Russell write, dominant obesity discourse that perpetuates simplistic and harmful ideas about weight abounds in many realms, including informal and informal sites of learning. There is more evidence of ways education feeds fat oppression than disrupts it. 
Fat pedagogy thus focuses not only on critique, but also on developing approaches that tackle fat oppression head on and can transform learning spaces so that everybody can flourish. The last part of that quote really got to me and I thought started thinking about how does fatness show up in learning spaces. Teaching and learning are both embodied practices that highlight performance and affect. Our bodies are always involved, but for some, it's a more invisible part of learning or teaching. For fat teachers and students, it is near impossible to separate their body from the learning space. As can be seen in this quote, I apologize that it's quite long, from Allie Verse Lewis, Carly Agostino, and Melanie Cassidy's article on the performative femininity of fat librarians. They discuss classrooms that are built for straight-sized bodies. This means that fat teachers are on display in how they move around and interact with the space. While students are not typically as on display as an instructor might be, fat students too must navigate this space that was not built for their bodies. Classroom furniture is not typically weight or size inclusive, forcing students to sit uncomfortably or even in pain, restrain their movements, and as Ashley Hedrick and Derek Attig argue, police themselves in the learning space. Fat librarian Roger Chabot also found that library furniture is not often size inclusive, leading him to question the li library's missions to inclusivity and creating participatory environments if we cannot accommodate a diversity of bodies in our spaces. These learning spaces are not designed for fat folks and often have discriminatory effects on them. We may not always have control over the physical learning spaces in which we teach. We may be able to advocate for more size inclusive furniture in our libraries, but where we as instructors may have some more control is in how and what we teach. One of the aims of fat pedagogy is to raise awareness about fat oppression and question and critique common narratives that fat is bad or ugly or inherently unhealthy. You may have noticed that throughout this talk, I've used the word fat rather than overweight or obese. People identifying as fat is often seen as an act of reclamation of a term that has often been wielded to harm. In fat studies, fatness is used to just simply describe a diversity of bodies. Fat activists have argued for years that the terms overweight and obese are harmful and oppressive. When we say overweight, we are saying that there is an ideal weight and anything above that is abnormal. This places a value judgment on a person's appearance, whereas fat is merely a descriptive term similar to height or hair color. The term obese explicitly medicalizes fatness, which further marginalizes fat folks, implying there is something wrong that must be cured. Fat studies and fat pedagogy ask us to be skeptical and to deconstruct what we have been told about fatness, decouple it from pathology, and acknowledge the gendered and racialized origins of anti-fat bias. We must reckon with healthism, idea, the idea that health is virtuous and those who do not fit our preconception of health are less than, regardless of what other factors may influence their actual health. For example, when I work with health-related students in information literacy sessions, they're often familiar with social determinants of health. But when fatness is discussed, there's typically the perception that fatness is an individual choice and that adverse health outcomes can be avoided by simply losing weight but there is ample evidence that health and weight do not always go clearly hand in hand, and that weight stigma and weight cycling are often correlated to adverse health outcomes at a higher rate than weight itself. Library systems perpetuate this issue. Caitlin Angle and Charlotte Price explored how the Library of Congress classification system classifies fat studies books, which are largely social science. Out of the 23 books they reviewed, 17 were classified as R's, the class for medicine. They also found that despite a surge in publications within fat studies, there is no fat study subject heading. These works tend to get classified under terms related to quote, obesity. This trend is also seen in controlled vocabulary for various social science and medical databases. Engel and Price argue that these classifications cause access confusion as their locations are not intuitive and further perpetuate the pathologization and denigration of fat, relegating the important texts of fat positive academics and activists to medicine. Unfortunately, in the decades since this article was written, not much of this has changed as many of the texts I consulted for this project are still classified in these ways. We must be aware of how these issues with language when teaching our students how to access resources. Even if our various classification systems were more inclusive, we could still use instruction sessions to teach critical thinking about language. Why might fat activists prefer the term weight stigma rather than the popularized term of fat phobia? How can we help students take their topics about weight and choose more liberating language? As librarians, we often help students shape their research topics or questions. 
We encourage them uh, to conduct their literature searches with a curious and open mind. We teach them evaluation skills. Um, and if we are working towards fat liberation, we can use fat pedagogy to do these things. This could look like using search examples related to fatness as a means of consciousness raising as described by Maria Accardi. This can open up a conversation about what biases we're bringing into our research and what gaps might exist. We can also encourage them to ask better questions when evaluating health and weight related research as fat activist Reagan Chastain often shares on her Instagram as some of these questions can be seen here. These are all questions practices that we can easily weave into our teaching to help mitigate anti-fat bias in our students' research and work towards fat liberation. I hope this talk has made you curious and open to unpacking anti-fat bias and exploring fat liberation for your life or your teaching. There is space for folks of all sizes in this conversation, but the centering of fat people's lived experiences is imperative. Throughout this talk, I have aimed to cite mainly fat scholars and activists. In my own personal learning journey, I have focused on reading and listening to fat people. Here is a list of folks that I have and I'm continuing to learn from and would encourage you to do the same. Thank you very much for your time and please reach out if you'd like to continue this conversation. Oh, sorry. I don't know where my stop screen is. Do I have the right screen up, Annalise? Yes. Excellent. Okay. Uh, so hi, uh, welcome to our presentation, uh, which is Critical Information Literacy is for Everyone. In this presentation, we're going to be discussing our experience of developing a community-based critical information literacy course. Uh, but to start, we wanted to give some positionality statements. Uh, I'm Susie Wilson. I'm a queer settler of Irish and English descent. I'm also the data services librarian at the University of Northern British Columbia and we're located in Prince George, British Columbia, Canada. And I'm Annalise Dowd. I am a queer white settler of Norwegian and Scottish descent and access services librarian also at UNBC. We're both continuing librarian members within our campus faculty union as well. So we would like to acknowledge that this work took place and we currently reside on the traditional and ancestral territories of the Claytley Tene. We also want to acknowledge that this work took place within the context of a colonial post-secondary institution whose region covers a significant portion of North Central BC and has campuses on the traditional territories of many indigenous peoples. So the program where we taught this course is actually run by the local college in Prince George, uh, which is the College of New Caledonia, or CNC. They offer programs typical of Canadian colleges, uh, so that's things like trade certificates uh, and programs, diplomas, high school upgrading, and lower division undergraduate courses. The Street Humanities program, uh, which has a name that we acknowledge is kind of problematic, is gr a grant funded program that began in 2005 for at risk and vulnerable adults who are socially excluded from recognized models of citizenship due to poverty, substance use, lack of housing and unemployment. We'd like to note that in Canada, Indigenous people are overrepresented in all of these categories, in addition to having lower graduation rates from high school, and this is equally true in Prince George. This means that a significant proportion of students in the street humanities program are Indigenous and have likely had a history of negative experiences in educational systems. In this program, volunteers teach month-long evening classes. Um, my favorite one is one of CNC's deans always teaches an introduction to art history. Um, and students receive bus passes and meals as part of this semester long program, which is a small cohort of 10 to 15 students. The goal of this program is to introduce participants to the college and post-secondary education more generally as something non-intimidating and welcoming. So I knew about this program from having worked at CNC in a staff position in their library and seeing the students from Street Humanities was always a highlight. Um, I especially liked watching those who graduated from the program and then continued their education at the college or elsewhere. So after moving to UNBC in a faculty role um, where I had time to develop my interest in critical information literacy, I decided to approach Annalise about volunteering with a course focused on that. While we both teach in liaison areas as part of our roles at UNBC, neither one of us had truly really had the opportunity to create uh, critical information literacy specific instructional sessions. 
And how I got involved, um, while I'm Access Services Librarian now, I started my career at UMBC as an instructional librarian teaching embedded in one-shot sessions to classes across the university and integrating critical information literacy where possible. In recent years, um, I've been in an embedded role in an introductory digital humanity humanities course and discussed critical digital humanities and algorithmic oppression and justice. So when Susie brought this idea um, to teach critical information literacy more holistically and work beyond the confines of our institutional structure, I was really keen to be involved. So we designed our month long course. So that's for three hour lectures um, centered on critical information literacy with an overarching goal of having the students reflect on their roles, not only as information consumers, but information creators. The sessions included the history of libraries and classification, a session on the false portrayal of algorithms and neutrality, a session on indigenous knowledge um, and authority in information systems, and a final session where students would create a zine as a reflective exercise. Students in this program traditionally appreciate having homework, uh, so we also gave them all journals with prompts for reflection between sessions, as well as journaling and sharing time at the beginning of each class. We did this because we wanted to make sure to center the students and their experiences in this course. So we also took the approach of planning general themes for the classes in advance, but left ourselves space to design or redesign specifics for each class to suit the interests of the students as we went along. Our first session um, was about the history of library and information more broadly. In this session, students worked in groups to investigate the libraries locally in Prince George via their online presence and reflect on who the library is for, if they felt that they would be welcome there. From there, we addressed some basic concepts of knowledge classification and had a discussion about the harms of neutrality, examining how different libraries describe different materials as well. Session two was focused on algorithms, information, and power. So we started with an exercise allowing them to examine how lived experience affects how we conceive of algorithms using real life tasks. In this case, we had them write down all the steps you need to do to do a load of laundry. Um, and then we turned to algorithmic bias using the work of Sophia Moja Noble and Joy Boilamwini as a foundation for a discussion about discriminatory algorithms and design and the present struggle for algorithmic justice. We also discussed issues of personal data privacy, practical methods of protecting personal data online, and had students reflect on their views of data privacy using my favorite website, I Know Where Your Cat Lives, as an example. So sessions three and four were never to be due to COVID-19. It was March 2020. Um, but our third session uh, involved uh, information about authority and bias in information systems, and we plan to have a guest speaker addressing Indigenous knowledge systems and data sovereignty. And our final session, we planned an activity day where students created scenes depicting how they see themselves, both as information creators and consumers. So we want to now reflect on some things, and we're going to start with what worked well. So the program itself was really excited and supportive to have new instructors in a new course. Um, I think we were the first people outside of CNC for a long time to volunteer. So our class and us as uh, outside people were highlighted by the program at internal presentations. Uh, the students were also incredibly engaged, probably more than most classes we've ever taught as part of our instructional responsibilities. And we found that team teaching was very effective in the context in this context in terms of developing the content and having multiple perspectives on it, but also just having two people in the room to assist students when they needed it, especially when we were using technology. Um, so, of course, talking about what went well, there were also things that didn't go so well um, that were good learning opportunities. Um, so very engaged students were also something of a double edged sword. Um, we didn't allot quite enough time for discussion, and we based our timing on what our previous experiences teaching uh, undergraduate sessions. So we did have a few content related hiccups related to that. Um, because we were rushed for time, some topics needed a little bit more time and care, such as harmful subject headings. 
Um, and these ended up falling towards the end of class without the appropriate time needed to properly debrief. Um, we also accidentally picked a very contentious example, and this feels very Canadian. Um, our recent, recently fired, very publicly racist hockey commentator was an example when we were discussing the harms of neutrality to marginalized groups. And what we didn't expect was that uh, multiple students jumped to the defense of the racist. Um, while this is not ideal, uh, both these situations did lead to incredibly thoughtful discussions as a group and did sort of reiterate and remind us that we were designing this course for a group in a context much different than a typical undergraduate classroom. We also want to mention that uh, due to the unfortunate timing of when we had this class, um, our class was really weird. We had one normal class, one class the week where the world was shutting down. Um, and then the rest of the program was canceled very abruptly. Uh, this means we didn't really get to engage with the students for feedback. And we also didn't have time to be reflective practitioners because we were dealing with our workplace's response to the COVID-19 pan pandemic at the same time. So moving on to what's next. Um, so Street Humanities came back for a shortened session in 2022, which we weren't able to participate in due to scheduling conflicts, but it is back for a full session in the spring of 2023, and we will be teaching. So based on feedback from the participants, the classes have been shortened to two three-hour lectures. So right now we're currently working on adjusting our content, which was a lot. We were covering, covering lots of different topics to meet this new condensed schedule. And I've also been approached by uh, someone who I knew already, um, but saw the like internal hype machine about our uh, program, our class, who wants to integrate critical information literacy modules into the English upgrading curriculum at CNC, and we're hoping to start that um, in the winter semester. Sorry, we went a tiny bit over, and thank you. Hi, um, I, I'm Rachel King. Um, I use the pronoun she, her, and I am at Rowan University. And I'll just say that um, Rowan University is three campuses, all in New Jersey, and they are located on the occupied traditional lands of the Nanticoke Lenni Lenape tribal nation. Um, specifically, I work in the context of the medical uh, school. We actually have two medical schools. And um, so really just talking about the role of librarians and librarianship in um, the kind of hierarchies that exist in these institutions. Okay, so medical libraries, very hierarchical structures, which are influenced by certain institutional values. There, I've worked for a long time actually in um, health sciences libraries that were not medical libraries, in academic libraries. And one thing about me medical libraries is that it's um, that's striking is the way you are working within the kind of intersection of the educational sector, the healthcare sector, some sort of hybrid. My, my particular situation is one where we're serving both a, a university hospital as well as a medical school. So it can kind of cover all of these different things. But again, you know, the educational sector in the current moment is very de decidedly the neoliberal academy. And then, of course, the healthcare sector is the profit driven medicine. But in many ways, the medical libraries are really defined by the by the collections about what they contain, because there are so many different stakeholders and kind of disparate models for what a medical library can be. But in my experience, you know, we're talking about serving students, faculty, researchers, um, physicians, and other clinicians, uh, administrators purely in higher education, also hospital administrators, healthcare executives, and patients as well. Um, because this is a lightning talk, I'm not going to play video. Um, I will be sharing this these slides, but I think I think it's really striking. Um, this is a video of students discussing medical students discussing their student debt. 
Uh, also for reasons of time, I'm not really doing a poll, but I want to ask you to ask yourselves what you think the amount of undergraduate debt, and I'm specifying here that I'm, I'm talking about a number that is does not include undergraduate debt that students may be carrying. Uh, so the answer here is roughly 200,000 purely coming from medical school. It can be a little bit smaller uh, at public universities within state students, larger for students obviously at private colleges, but this is pretty much the average. Um, so I, I, the reason why I noted is because it is very much a feature of medical education. Um, it, it is the beginning of initiating students into a culture that accepts and propagates certain historical hierarchies. Um, saddling these now young physicians with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt makes them potentially susceptible to the consolations of prestige and may make them invested in it and its perpetuation. Um, but what I want to offer is just the fact that these are really arbitrary, very arbitrary hierarchies. So I'm going to use as an example two rungs or two um, stakeholders within medical libraries and the and and sort of medicine in general. In the West, and I'm specifically not talking about other traditions, I'm talking about uh, certain received hierarchies and attitudes um, within the United States. Um, in the West, historically, met, you know, physicians and even more surgeons occupied a fairly low rung in, within the hierarchy of society, surgeons in particular, seen as workmen who, you, and I do mean men, workmen who use their hands, whereas librarians were scholars who use their brains. And then, of course, today we've seen this shift where medicine, physicians are very privileged, there's this knowledge work, it is extremely scientific and intellectual, whereas librarianship is a helpless, is a helping profession kind of predicated on selfless customer service. However, the reality is both, both professions, medical librarianship and medicine, are melding STEM and a humanistic model of service, but they're regarded really differently and their practitioners are made to think of themselves very differently. Um, so what we see is that there's this complete upending over the past century, century and a half in terms of what the attitudes about the professions are, but the stereotypes of race class and gender are remaining absolutely the same. The this survival, according to Stephen Bales, the survival of older ideologies under capitalism suggests that these stubborn institutions are retained because they profit capitalism. And so we can see this complete upending about the way different people and different professions are regarded, which is a different professions are regarded, but the people underneath who occupy certain identities find that these things never really change. Um, it's true that high-tech medicine may be, may require more um, knowledge, more skill. The same actually can also be said of librarianship as well as nursing, which is another field that occupies a fairly similar role that, li that medical librarianship does of, of being kind of a selfless, feminized customer service oriented part of uh, medicine. Um, and of course, that's because of the influence of gender, class, and race on individual career choice and patterns of employment. Um, you know, just to give a quick history, we're, this, is a, this is a pie chart, which is, shows the representation within the field of medicine. Uh, from a few years ago. Uh, what, whether you can see the, the specifics or not, you can certainly see the broad outlines of this orange part of the pie chart is the representation of uh, white physicians. And this little sliver here, uh, blue, it represents African-American uh, physicians. There is a long history, a legacy of racism throughout the medical field, but particularly striking is the way in the 19th century, in the beginning of the 20th century, there was a complete disenfranchisement of African-American physicians who were not allowed to join the AMA, who pretty much had their own patients taken away from them and replaced by white doctors. Getting that number down to about 2% and now it's back up to about 5%. So like 
still nothing close to real representation and the damage has been done. And really even in 2022 has not been remedied substantially. Um, what was a very male dominated profession actually has in recent years attained a kind of gender parity. But this is a period in which um, medicine has changed from being a more having more independent practitioners to now having more employed practitioners and with the growth of for profit healthcare. Which means that in this increasingly now feminized profession of medicine, doctors are more and more subordinate to administrators. Um, Alexander Carruthers has said that the feminization of a profession refers not only to the demographic change in a profession, but also the profession's adoption of feminine characteristics. And so we see this kind of subordination happening just at the moment when women are finally achieving parity within the profession. Um, medicine may potentially lose prestige. Uh, and I do think that the pandemic does kind of have a role, or at least we're seeing how little autonomy, you know, oftentimes doctors have, how little respect they're given uh, and how their working conditions have been impacted um, it, because they are not really in the position of the same kind of position of control. And, but I'm, I'm just going to say sort of quickly as we wrap up, the loss of prestige is not a meaningful flattening of hierarchy or a challenging of power because we're really just finding other people, administrators, executives and whatnot, kind of occupying the highest rung of the profession. Um, and so just really about, uh, just to kind of wrap up, to talk about our role of this already feminized profession of medical librarianship, where do we fit in? Um, we're in a, okay, we're in a climate of austerity that is really designed to enrich shareholders um, uh, and show up the power of administrators and librarians are often asked to, to sacrifice. As an academic librarian, I was always told to like think of the students, but now in addition to thinking of the students, I also have to think about the patients. Like, you know, my actions must not detract from, must not uh, in any way um, be too demanding lest the patients suffer. But our healthcare system doesn't really exist primarily to treat sick patients. It exists to be profitable. These are numbers, the growth in, uh, in um, the healthcare in healthcare stocks is, is twice what the growth in other stocks has been. And so getting back to the pain of students finding that they're sinking enormous amounts of money and becoming extremely indebted simply for the, for the ability to, to practice medicine, we're putting them in a position where they are becoming invested in prestige because if you are in a subordinate position where you are immensely indebted, unable really to do anything but become a doctor at the end of four years and $200,000 in debt, no choice really to enter this profession, don't really have much choice to do anything else because of the, the need to be able to pay the debt off, um, we are kind of inculcating students into this exclusive club. And so we're asked to uh, continue to perpetuate the current system with these feminized values. And we are also often asked to accept the casualization of labor. And so just um, my final note is to really resist a lot of this ideological um, indoctrination and sort of to remember that we really should not be sorting ourselves along education level and employment status. And librarians, I mean, I consider myself to be very privileged to be, uh, you know, to have been the beneficiary of a uh, graduate education. And so not kind of mirroring or perpetuating our, our role or our stature, not trying to kind of keep a, a, a finger, our fingers clinging to our stature, our status, but to really think about flattening the hierarchy entirely. Thank you.
sorry. <laughs> okay. Hey, um, hi, my name is Tav Haver. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I'm currently a research and instruction librarian at Williams College um, in Williamstown, Massachusetts. And I just want to acknowledge that Williams College stands on the ancestral homelands of the Stockbridge Muncie Mohicans, who are the indigenous peoples of the region now called Williamstown. So following tremendous hardship after being forced from their valued homelands, the Stockbridge Muncie Mohicans continue to um, live as a sovereign tribal nation in Wisconsin, where they reside today. So for my time today, I'm going to focus on work that I've done using portraiture methodology. So a methodology practice mainly in art education to carve out a space for reflective practices and design assessments really based in reflection. By the end of this lightning talk, I'm hoping that you'll know a little bit more about portraiture methodology and using theory within the instructional design process, um, as well as consider some ways of bringing reflective practices into info lit instruction as assessment or icebreakers or however you think about assessment and reflection. Um, so I'm going to start by talking a little bit about portraiture methodology. And then I'm going to show you three different assessment activities I've used in the classroom, asking students to critique power, positionality, and process in the research process. Cool. Oops. So what is portraiture methodology? Um, portraiture methodology is a form of qualitative inquiry that was developed by Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot and Jessica Hoffman Davis to our educators teaching at Harvard in the 1990s. Um, like the way that I think about it is that it's a methodology that really links investigation with creation. In their book, The Art and Science of Portraiture, Hoffman Davis and Lawrence Lightfoot lay out five frames of the methodology um, as an approach for investigating and also really embracing the complexity of a situation while also, you know, really situating yourself in it like conceptually and in a lot of ways like physically as a researcher. So just to go through the frames kind of quickly, um, context, the setting, the physical, geographic, political, cultural place that you find yourself in, either as like a researcher or like where the subject is, voice, the perspectives and expressions of the researcher, as well as their dialogue with the subject, relationship, the co-construction of interpretation and narrative, um, this notion of like co-construction is is super important in in their in their methodology and how they think about being like an active community member while also being a responsible and ethical researcher um emergent themes the iterative and generative process i i love how they they phrase this they, they call it the data shape and form which i just think is is so cool um and then finally the um aesthetical the finished product product so just an initial thought that stands out, um, portraiture methodology honors students as creators while also contextualizes the research as an active and creative thing um, with both like a political background and political and personal stakes. Practitioners of portraiture um, from, from my like literature scan, from like what I know about it are like really rooted in the art ed world, but it shares like a, an intense relationship with critical pedagogy and especially CRT. Um, a lot of the work that I've read is mostly about like this notion of like artist formation as like a developmental thing and how artist formation is like an intellectual process of knowledge creation. Um, so just to clarify, like my work with portraiture methodology isn't so much about having students take on portraiture as much as it's um, a way of like conceptualizing like my thinking with instructional design. Okay. So, um, in order to like to create the, these assessments, I, I use the emergent um, frame, themes frame um, to conceptualize this notion and really question what I valued about teaching people. Um, also, like what I hope for, what solidarities I I have with students, um, and motivate some deeper thinking about people who are growing researchers and you know what I want to know about the research landscapes that they find themselves in. Um, hmm. My feeling is that like the emergent themes frame, um, it's a kind of a temporal and philosophical junction between reflection and action. So when when I came across it, I really like jumped on it and, and like sort of went for blood for thinking about 
how to bring reflection into the classroom and motivate some deeper thinking about who people are as researchers and yeah, what, what they really wanna do. Um, okay, so I'm about to transition and actually show you some of the assessment activities and, and artifacts that students created. Um, I wanna let you know that like, it's, it's what I asked students to do is really hard. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm really like just like a thousand shout outs for students who really went for it and really trusted me. Okay, first assessment. Please create a diagram of your research practice. Um, the kind of like perennial question I have with assessment is like, what am I trying to assess? That became a really central question with reflection. Um, I needed to create like, you know, sort of shadows of assessment goals that existed like almost side, like, like right next to, like they were like the peripheral of my like learning objectives. So are students able to describe what motivates a reflexive and iterative process? So this is one that a student did. Um, it's been a little bit translated by me from like, you know, from a, a screenshot of them holding up their, their diagram. Um, I think it's awesome. I think it's so cool. I love how they have like the things, the search and how like, you know, it's this interesting like web of like, you know, ways of engagement. Um, they also created this key that are found in different places, right? So like this urge to collect everything shows up twice. Obsession only exists in the things. It doesn't ex exist in the search, but like, you know, that's them. Um, I really also love that they mapped out the sense. I would I would love to just get like a diagram of, of what the sense is. Okay, next one. Um, I, I introduced students to a, a Microsoft Paint like emulator <laughs> pretty early on in like my relationships with them, um, just because it's sick, just because it's cool. Um, this is a cool one. I really enjoy this one. So the student break starts by breaking up their ideas and then they actually have two notions of reading, right? So like my understanding of it is like, as they, like they, the initial motivation to read is a hope to know, right? Like a hope to like gain knowledge, but then like it becomes like this additional like desire to like revise or fix or create something a little bit more politically like saturated and like interesting, you know? This notion of fixing came up like a lot in sessions. They weren't all like abstract and awesome. Um, a lot of them looked like this, you know, they were just like super linear, like start. And I saw a lot of them like tree kind of paragraphs, you know. Okay, assessment two, translation practice. So how do students articulate steps of research in co concrete steps and abstract concepts? Um, so I nabbed this quote by Walter Benjamin, who is a, a favorite of, of mine, but also some students. Um, he wrote the work of art in the age of its mechanical reproducibility. Um, so students, students that I work with at least are pretty familiar with it. Um, so I asked students to translate this um, by replacing prose with research. This was mega hard. Students did not enjoy it. Um, and the next time I did it, I created just like the Mad Libs version, which was way more successful. Um, happier students for sure. Okay, next one, emoji portraits. These are great, these are cool. I really wanted to know how students place their interests, choices and personalities into the context of research, right? So like what kind of researchers are there? Um, I don't know, I'm curious about like what researchers might exist that we don't have the names for yet. Like, who are they? How do they think about themselves? Who are these growing researchers? And here are three of the portraits that I got back. So um, we have a high-vis skunk avoiding COVID, which I mean, classic, it's awesome. We have internet wizard with bacon. Not really sure what's going on with this, just love internet wizard. And then Angry Snail Surrounded by Books in Capital, um, which I feel like we could all really identify with at some point. Okay, so ideas for creating assessments. Um, center process, this is what worked best for me. Really like lean into differentiated learning, think about like 
what is the thing that students can do that encourages them like to think metacognitively? If you've used it as an icebreaker, you can probably use it as an assessment. Also champion the political dimension. Um, you know, underwriting assessment objectives as secret twins, really, really strong for me. Um, I don't feel like I'm done. I feel like there's a lot more I could do. Mostly leaning more towards somatics and constraint-based searching, um, but that's much later on. And if you're interested, these are just like some cool places where you can start learning about portraiture methodology. Okay, cool. Thank you. Hey everyone, um, thank you for being here and joining us on, on our lightning talk, celebrating student voice through the annual first year experience exhibition at University of Delaware. And the, uni of, uh, the University of Delaware occupies land vital to the web of life for Lena Lenape and Nanji Kok, who share their ancestry, history, and future in this region. And my name is Yu Chao Bridges Hao. I'm the Pauline Aya resident and visual literacy librarian. And today, we are going to be discussing how an annual exhibition of first year student artwork and writings allow us to privilege student voice and welcome students as full participants in the academic community and scholarly spaces of library and museums. All right, and I'm Lauren Wallace. I'm the first year experience and student success librarian. Um, so we want to start with some context on how this exhibition of student work comes to be and how it's connected to the curriculum. So each year, the exhibition is sort of the culmination of an introductory self-guided program um, that we designed, that the library and museum staff designs. Um, and it's based on the common reader, um, which is a text that's assigned um, in our required first year seminar course. So um, just for some examples of our past common readers, this year we had While the Earth Sleeps We Travel, which is a collection of writing and artwork by refugee youth. Last year we had Under a White Sky, which deals with climate change and environmental issues. And um, in 2020, we had Dear America, which is a memoir about life as an undocumented person. So we have kind of these, these three pieces. We have our first year seminar course that's required for students. Um, we have our common reader that's assigned in that course. And then we have our library and museums introductory program um, that you know, is meant to orient students to library and museums resources, but also is themed around the common reader. So we wanna share some background on what students do in our library and museums program and how that leads up to them creating their own artwork or writing that we ultimately use in this exhibition. So these are some examples of elements from our program this year, which is called Meant to Be Here. Um, that title is inspired by a line in our common reader. So the program um, revolves around students viewing exhibitions that highlight themes from the common reader. Um, those include artwork from museums, historical materials from special collections, and films and games. And Utah will share a little bit more about how we create those exhibitions in a moment. Um, so in addition to viewing those exhibitions, uh, listening to some podcasts about them, um, students also complete a small research task. And then the final thing they do is to create what we call a digital reflection. And we have a really broad prompt for that. Um, they can uh, reflect on the common reader, they can talk about their experience in the library or museums, and we get images, GIFs, videos, we get hand drawings and handwritten poems, and students can opt um, whether or not they want to allow us to use their work in future exhibitions or presentations like this one. Um, so what you're seeing now are some examples of student work from last year when we had an environmental theme common reader um, which is why we see some sad frogs and turtles. Um, and then this is an example of that student work in the context of our online exhibition platform. Um, so we use the same online platform that's used for all of our special collections and museums exhibitions. So we're intentionally putting student work in that sort of official context. 
So I will turn it over to you, Shana. So before showing the student exhibition, I will talk about the exhibitions that the Library Museum and Press put together. So in this program, students interact with art exhibitions and special collections materials related to things from the required first year common reader, uh, a representative from each of the three teams, museums, special collections, and film and video collections join the first year experience program planning. This cross-departmental group discuss themes of the common reader and each put together an exhibition with objects from their own collection. So the museum exhibition is held at one of the museum galleries, like we see on the right picture on this page. Um, the special collection exhibition at the case beside the reading room, as you can see on the left of this page. And the film and video exhibition outside of the reading room, as in the middle. They not only serve as objects to help students reflect on the common reader scenes, but also get to a physical places that house valuable educational resources. Next page. So we designed the program with both in-person and virtual tracks to facilitate uh, flexibility and accessibility for uh, on-campus students, as well as remote students, which include a high number of first-generation, low-income, and international students. So we always refer to uh, choose your own adventure. On the right, you see the page for an in-person visit. Students listen to podcasts while walking through each of the exhibitions. On the other hand, the virtual track ensures students have the same access to exhibitions as those who choose the in-person track, where they watch videos with images of the exhibition while listening to the podcast. The program design resonates to the universal design for learning in which we provide multiple means of representation to give students various ways of acquiring information and knowledge. And next page. So uh, we lead students through the program by asking questions rather than feeding them with information with readings and demos. We give students a simple yet inclusive prompt to reflect on an issue from the common reader or their uh, own experience researching or living artworks during the library and museum introductory program. Once again, we apply the universal design to make sure students have multiple means of expression to demonstrate what they know and multiple means of engagement to tap into students' interest, challenge them appropriately and motivate them to learn. So on this page, you can see a word cloud um, that sum up many of the questions we embedded in the uh, podcast for the past three years. For example, we show students um, the example from our collection and we ask them, would you notice about how the artists depict nature? Or what do you think of when you hear the word such as refugees? And we also ask them, would you be convinced by this piece of evidence and also ready to create your own work? Incentivized by the reflection questions, we have found that students are willing to discuss their life a little bit experience related to, to the book topics and reflect on everyday injustice they observe in American society. For example, students have shared their family experiences with uh, undocumented status and reflected on environmental protection as a social justice issue. We hope that by embedding ideas from critical pedagogy, students will learn beyond knowledge and understand that the background, experiences, and knowledge they hold are a part of the conversation of culture, power, and social justice. All right, and to expand a little bit on those ideas of privileging um, student experience and start to wrap, wrap us up here, um, one thing that we um, have in mind when we're creating the online exhibition and we're choosing student work is letting the themes that arise in their work and the, the types of work we're seeing just kind of guide our curation process. So one example, um, in 2020, when we had a theme of immigration and like American identity, and then again in 2021, when the book was about um, environmental issues, we saw activism and working for a better future arise a lot in students' work. So there's some examples of that on the left. 
Um, and then we also think a lot about privileging um, sort of non-traditional or um, uh, emerging modes of creation. So memes, um, images with emojis overlaid that sort of look like a social media post. Um, as well as draft work, handwritten and hand-drawn um, items. So you see some of those on the right there. Um, so we will end with that. Um, this self-guided program and the corresponding exhibition is something we plan to continue. We've seen um, interest from campus collaborators on um, just being involved with it um, and with us, which is great. Um, so uh, Yu Chao is going to put links for our two online exhibitions from the past two years in the chat if you want to take a look um, in more depth. And we couldn't leave without spotlighting one of our all-time favorite submissions, which is a cat Zoom meeting in which, if you look at the chat, the cats are talking about how humans are racist and need to get their act together. So just a lovely example of our students' creativity. Um, so thank you so much uh, for listening. Hello, and thank you for attending. I'm Amy G, Reference and Online Learning Librarian at Shenandoah University in Virginia. I'm new to studying critical reflection as it relates to online learning librarianship, and I'm excited to learn and discuss these ideas. Unless your academic background is in education, you probably didn't receive much or any formal training in how to teach. This is certainly the case for me. I've been doing it in various settings for about 20 years now, yikes. And it was only when I joined the staff of a large research library in 2017 that I could benefit from a community of practice that included the university's Center for Teaching and Learning and a team of library instruction colleagues. Coincidentally, you just heard from two of them. <laughs> Um, last year, in the wake of the pandemic, I transitioned to a newly created role at a smaller university where the focus of my work as online learning librarian is developing and deploying asynchronous learning resources, although I still do some synchronous teaching. This brings new challenges, unlike the familiar pitfalls of the traditional one shot that are so well elucidated in the recent special issue of college and research libraries. I often design lessons with um, from scratch and only constraints I have are the tools available and my own abilities. Um, the creative freedom is fantastic, but I miss the immediate feedback and the formative assessment that happens um, from interacting with learners and other teachers in the classroom. I miss my community of practice. I can collect statistics about users interactions with digital learning objects, but how do I know um, if they're really helping the students learn. So uh, critical reflection. Um, why critical reflection is um, partly my inclination to reflect on events as a way of making meaning in my life, um, but that doesn't make the practice of critical reflection a comforting one. Receiving feedback and questioning my core assumptions about my work can be discomforting acknowledging my discomfort and considering how it stems from my unexamined beliefs and assumptions is part of the work. For me, this practice is a form of resistance to the neoliberal academy's pressure to always be producing quantifiable work. It also resists academic aspirations to objectivity and neutrality by prioritizing what Jesse Stommel has called, quote, an intense subjectivity. So what is critical reflection? I find Jack Mesereau's definition useful. Um, for Mesereau, critical reflection requires us to pause and reassess the fundamental perspectives through which we make meaning of events. Quote, critical reflection is not concerned with the how or the how-to of action, but with the why, the reasons for, and consequences of what we do. End quote. Instead of asking, how can I do this better? It asks, why am I doing this? Is it producing the intended results? Is it producing other unintended consequences? Booth's user method, 
exemplifies a reflective instructional design practice that addresses the how to do instruction better part uh, through a cycle of understanding needs, structuring lessons, engaging learners, and reflecting on outcomes. But because it doesn't really interrogate the foundational assumptions of LAS teaching, I wouldn't call it critical reflection. One of my major concerns when I started down this path was, how do I see beyond my own perspective? How do I know I'm not just confirming my own assumptions? The discomfort I mentioned before is one way. Uh, another way is to borrow Stephen Brookfield's approach to critical reflection through four lenses. Autobiographical, as learner and teacher. Uh, students' view, colleagues' experiences, and the literature. This diagram from the 1995 text shows the four lenses trained on the teacher's assumptions about learners and learning in relation to power and hegemony. Critical reflection should be, to quote Paulo Freire, directed at the structures to be transformed. I'll describe how these four lenses help me reflect on my work, a work in progress. Through my autobiographical lens, I'm examining my motivation for teaching. I experienced a lot of early success as a student and school was a refuge for me during um, a turbulent childhood. But later when I became a first gen college student and then a PhD dropout, I experienced the ways that higher ed can alienate learners who don't benefit from generational experience. When I proposed this talk, I imagined I would share a collection of reflection questions carefully curated from the sources I've been reading. Um, I am gathering them, but this very simple question has become one of my touchstones. Who benefits or who can benefit? Addressing that question involves both accessibility and inclusion. When it comes to digital learning objects, I think we tend to be better prepared to consider accessibility. Um, accurate captions, alt text, transcripts, color contrasts, and audio descriptions, and I could go on. Um, but also being mindful of pacing, clarity, cognitive load, of using inclusive examples, images, and sources, of explaining enough without over explaining. There's a lot of work to do there, and I'm still working on it. Here are a few ways I try to see through the student lens. I may include affective check-ins, like starting the citation tutorial I made by asking students how they feel when they think about citations. Not great. Um, I end classes and uh, interactive modules with a reflective exit ticket, asking students to consider how they will use one thing they learned from the lesson. I also prompt for anonymous feedback, error reports, and further questions. When I receive feedback that perplexes or annoys me at first, my practice helps me reconsider what the student is seeing. If they missed a point I made, maybe I need to mention it earlier in the tutorial or repeat it multiple times for emphasis. This quotation is another of my touchstones. Uh, this is by Joan Wink. If it doesn't matter to students, it doesn't matter. How can I convey to students why this matters? If I can't, maybe it doesn't. To this end, I'm refocusing the library's research guides on what students need to know and to be able to do with library resources in their courses and programs, rather than organizing them by source types and filling them with vast lists of barely relevant links. To use the lens of colleagues' experience, I participate in shared interest groups at my university on inclusive pedagogy and self-regulated learning. I send drafts of my work to other faculty members to ask for feedback. I come to gatherings like this to seek out a community of practice beyond my institution. A brief pause to thank the CLAPS 2022 organizers and the earlier presenters. I am learning something new every hour and hope to continue these conversations with you. Finally, the theory lens. How does the literature challenge my assumptions and challenge me to act? Here are two final examples, one that led to a small change and one that created a seismic shift. 
First, Kevin Siebers claps 2016 lightning talk on the rhetoric of scholarly versus popular gave me language to articulate a change I had wanted to make. Now my library's instructional content no longer pits these source types against one another rhetorically. Second, in a 2015 LOEX talk, Anne-Marie Dietering highlights the liberatory possibility for those of us teaching outside of credit-bearing courses and degree programs. While it might be hard for us to get people to engage with our material, from our liminal position, we can make the unwritten rules, values, and rewards of academia transparent to all of our students, while also doing what we can to dismantle structures that exclude, hurt, and discriminate. This assertion resonated with efforts I was already making. My interactive citation module focuses on building student confidence in their knowledge of the purpose and function of citations and where to get help with the details. My source evaluation module mentions that some instructors require peer-reviewed sources, but one of the outcomes for the activity is to identify social, political, and economic forces that affect the production and distribution of information. Beyond this, reading Dietering's talk is what led me to re-examine my motivation for teaching and the agency I have in teaching students not only how to do what their instructors want, but also how to make good use of the information that will be available to them when they leave the university. So check out my references for details on the texts I've discussed and alluded to. If you'd like to help contribute to a growing bibliography on this topic, please join the Zotero group I created and I'll share the link to my slides. Thank you. Hello, can you all hear me? Good. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Renee Walsh, and I am a STEM and data management librarian at UConn, um, and I will be talking about wellness and self-care collections in university libraries and how they are an opportunity for community engagement um, and critical pedagogy. Waiting for my slides to change. I might have to make it smaller if it's being. Hold on a second. Just give me one second, I'm so sorry. Okay, I'm going to make this smaller for the sharing just because um, of the issue with my computer being slow. Um, so the land on which the University of Connecticut is located is the territory of the Mohegan, Mashantucket, Pequo, Eastern Pequo, um, Nipmuc, and Lenape peoples. Um, our team for the Wellness Library, I'm the founding member uh, that began the project in 2020. Um, this year, my colleagues are Shay Reed, who's located on the Avery Point campus, and Jennifer Chaput. Um, people can cycle on and off for the amount of time that they want to be on the project um, with a minimum of a one-year com commitment if they are officially members. Um, the project began in 2020 and is made possible by strategic framework funding from UConn Library. And the principles of this project are um, connect, empower, and engage. So I'd like to start with the question of 
um, what are university libraries for? Who are they for? Um, what do we collect and what do we not collect? If you Google uh, university library, you'll come up with um, these images of monolithic, intimidating, uh, European styled uh, Western libraries. Um, and so we need to think about are university libraries meeting the needs of students holistically? Um, in terms of what we are not collecting, um, are there accessible books on mental health? Are there, me are there memoirs by Black, Indigenous, people of color, queer people? Um, do we only have, you know, strictly academic titles? Are there, you know, fun reads that are deemed non-academic that help students de-stress? What publishers do we collect? Do we collect independent or small press titles? Um, and so we need to think about um, the positionalities and identities of students that come to the library. And so um, it's a trend now to talk about whole student education and the whole student uh, framework um, incorporates relational pedagogy principles of social justice. Um, and you can see this in uh, our wellness library collection that I established, um, the top top clicks uh, for spring share titles last year. Um, you can tell that these are titles about mental health. They're related to being queer and um, also title on indigenous uh, food sources. Um, so I began this collection, so the, the idea was germinating in my mind. Um, since I started at UConn, um, I found it, I was distressed by the number of articles in our newspaper, student newspaper about mental health um, and about crises on campus. So when funding became available in 2020, um, I applied for funding. Um, to purchase books um, on these topics, books of titles that are belong beyond the collecting scope of the university library. Um, and so we're now in our third year. Uh, this is what the guide looks like. It's a spring share guide. Um, there are tabs for navigating to uh, different topics. And right now we have an event advertised for next week. Um, so far, we've done one event in person since spring 2021, when it became more um, possible to have more in-person interaction. Um, in the summer, I made a Primo Ex Libris um, collection. So this is just catalog only and provides catalog only links to titles. Um, so the elements of the wellness collection uh, include the Spring Share Live Guide, um, the Primo page, events, outreach. We do tabling, for example. Um, and possibly in the future, um, we'd like to get games that can be checked out by students. So that's another element that you could possibly include. So if you want to create your own wellness collection, I would recommend you have um, $1,500 to start. Um, you could apply for Carnegie Grant, for example, that um, offers funding for creating a reading list. That wouldn't help with the purchasing, but it would pay for the time um, that you are devoting to that. Um, there are ebook vendors that offer unlimited buyer ebooks uh, for around fifteen to twenty dollars. These are small presses, and I've listed them here, or they're presses that are focused on um, that are focused on mental health, like New Harbinger. 
Uh, we do outreach with our member Shay at Avery Point for Fresh Check Day, which is a suicide prevention event that happens can happen at any university. You can go to their website, Fresh Check. Our spring event um, was with a student entrepreneur named Allie Davenport, uh, who created a, a journal um, with activities um, for, to help with, um, you know, um, your mindset, uh, setting goals, um, promoting mindfulness. These are students that agreed to have their picture taken after the spring event. Next week, we're having an event led by Nishali Ahmed of our student health and wellness. She'll be leading us on a one hour mindfulness um, event. Um, I attended her one hour mindfulness for staff uh, last summer. And so that's how I got that idea. Events are sort of in the beta stage. Um, they were in demand last spring. But we could evolve to having events online in the future if it seems that like that's more in demand. In conclusion, um, I think it is important to interrogate the statement of uh, we don't collect this um, in university libraries like self help, um, BIPOC, self care, disability memoir. While the university primarily exists to offer research monographs, peer-reviewed journal articles and archives. It also needs to remember its mission to the intellectual life of all students at the university. An intersectional collection is a stronger collection, reflecting the many identities and positionalities of our students. In conclusion, I will leave you with this quote from Edouard Glissant, um, Edward Glissant, who was an um, intellectual from Martinique. He said, what makes the whole world is the actual poetics of the relation of this relation, which allows one to sublimate through knowledge of the self and the whole, both suffering and acceptance, the negative and the positive. Um, to me, this speaks to the fact that um, this relationality and knowledge of the self and being able to acknowledge all of one's identities allows one to sublimate the negative and the difficulties in our world. Um, thanks for listening. You can contact me for the information there. And I got the idea to add an Edward Glissant from the um, presenters that talked about relationality in their opening keynote. So I wanna thank them for helping me to think of this idea. All right, hey everyone. Um, real quick, Alex, can you confirm that the slides are good to go? They're good. Awesome, thank you. So hey everyone, um, uh, welcome to Crafting a Misinformation Literacy Teaching Toolkit. I'm Ashley Peterson. I'm a research and instruction librarian at UCLA uh, with a focus in data and media literacies. And I'm Alex Salodkaya, and I am the Rothman Family Food Studies Librarian and Liaison to Public Health. Uh, yeah, so over the next 10 minutes, Alex and I are going to describe this project, highlighting its structure and the structure of the toolkit, and also the ways that it supports critical pedagogy and librarianship. So first, we'd like to quickly thank the production team. Um, so the toolkit was a joint effort between several UCLA students. So Taylor Sieverling, Kian Ravier, and Max Grohlman, uh, as well as professional staff. So in addition to Alex and myself, our colleague, Chris Lopez. And the rest of the team is here with us in spirit today. And Alex and I are incredibly grateful for their vital contributions to the projects. So I'm gonna give a quick overview of just what the toolkit is. So short version, it's a resource intended for educators who wish to facilitate learning about misinformation. More specifically, it's intended to help learning communities constructively build an action-oriented understanding of the systemic causes of misinformation, including things like the technical, the economic, and the psychological underpinnings of navigating online information. 
So the toolkit encourages educators to build collaborative learning environments that give participants opportunities to reflect, share, and explore together. The toolkit is meant to be generative and it encourages users to adapt and remix the resources provided, as well as craft their own learning outcomes according to the needs of their own distinct learning communities. And just a note about our philosophical approach to building the toolkit, we didn't want to create something that makes it look easy to master misinformation, uh, since it definitely isn't. It is an extremely complex and nuanced topic, um, and also one that can be abused with a lot of uh, emotion and uh, affect. So we wanted the toolkit to be adaptable so anyone can use it for any discipline. We wanted it to be scalable so that teaching about misinformation doesn't always require library staff labor. And we also wanted it to be easily disseminated. So we felt very strongly that it should be in the form of a freely available web resource. Uh, and so now I'm gonna hand it over to Alex to show you more about what the toolkit uh, actually is. Thanks, Ashley, and hello again, everyone. I'll be walking you through a brief tour of the toolkit. Um, and before we start, I'd like to point out the tiny URL on the screen. That's a link to the toolkit, and we also included it in the chat if you want to look at it and follow along. Um, so the toolkit is located on a GitHub site which houses UCLA Libraries asynchronous research workshops and tutorials. The toolkit is included under tutorials in the lesson plans section page and it's structured in five basic sections, which are an introduction and instruction section, three learning outcome sections, and a feedback section. So the introduction and instructions just reiterate some of the information that Ashley's already shared, like the ethos behind the toolkit, which again is to create a collaborative learning environment and to facilitate conversations within communities of learning. So here we jump into the learning outcomes. This is our first learning outcome, which is um, identify the causes of misinformation. All of the learning outcomes follow the same basic structure. Um, underneath the stated outcome is the theoretical framework for that outcome. Here we describe how this learning outcome can help us better understand certain aspects of misinformation. For this learning outcome, um, the theoretical framework speaks to the complexity of the information ecosystem and points to three aspects of that ecosystem which encourage the proliferation of misinformation. And Ashley will address this, um, these three aspects in a little bit more detail momentarily. Next, we have the example learning activities for that outcome. For this particular outcome, um, we have presentation slides, ref reflection prompts, and a quiz to gauge student learning. Instructors are encouraged to build their own lesson plans around these particular activities and adapt them to their own disciplines as necessary. Next in the structure, we have resources for further investigation. These resources are intended to help instructors and learners dive deeper into that particular aspect of misinformation that relates to that learning outcome. The resources are pulled primarily from academic sources to provide evidence-based support for the content of the toolkit and then avenues for further inquiry. And instructors are encouraged to choose to assign these as pre or post work, depending, of course, on the needs of their class. Um, so here we have our second and third learning outcomes, which are to define information, misinformation, and disinformation, and then also to identify strategies for recognizing misinformation. You can see the theoretical frameworks, learning activities, and resources structure repeated here. And in the interest of time, I won't dive too deep into these. I will pass it off to Ashley to discuss how the toolkit addresses critical librarianship and pedagogy. And I really do encourage everyone to take a look at the toolkit when you have a chance. All right, thank you, Alex, for that overview. Um, so like Alex mentioned, I'm now gonna talk a bit about how we believe the toolkit supports the goals of critical librarianship and pedagogy. So first, as mentioned, the toolkit's learning outcomes, uh, as well as all of the associated theoretical frameworks and learning activities, really try to encourage a systemic understanding of online misinformation. So this includes interrogating the economic and educational power structures that shape our experiences online. 
So what we're looking at here is a slide within a slide. Um, it is from the learning example or an example learning activity under the learning outcome, identify the causes of misinformation. So the activities uh, that this slideshow is um, setting up prompt learners to explore three systemic causes of misinformation. So the psychology of information overload, internet platform business models, and outdated in internet literacy learning models. Um, and I saw a previous presenter mention uh, on their slide that they do not teach crap. So we go over that in this um, example learning activity as well. So just as an example. Um, so we also encourage learners to explore other systemic causes of misinformation beyond what we present in a further effort to interrogate not just the authority of online information brokers, but our own authority as educators. So everyone's authority gets deconstructed. And a second way that the toolkit supports critical librarianship is in how it encourages learners to constructively build action-oriented knowledge about misinformation. So the toolkit is entitled Understanding Misinformation, but we want there to be this implied understanding in order to fill in the blank on however a learner might take action to mitigate misinformation and its effects. So this slide is from the learning outcome, identify strategies for recognizing misinformation. And while yes, misinformation is a deeply systemic issue, we do take the time to discuss the role of individual agency to emphasize that there are actions that can be taken at the citizen level. These aren't the only actions and we're not putting the burden on the individual, but we do wanna emphasize that there are actions to be taken. So we encourage learners to take a metacognitive approach, recognizing that when something they encounter elicits an emotional reaction, uh, and from there, enacting skills in a fact checkers toolkit, such as lateral reading and following claims of evidence. The slideshow then goes on to set up an activity that prompts learners to explore the flow of information between social media, news media, and the academy by focusing on a single instance of scientific misinformation that students are prompted to find on a social media platform. They explore the claims uh, of this piece of misinformation in both popular media and scientific literature in order to get a sense of how information can be communicated and distorted across audiences and platforms, as well as their own role as consumers or creators of these various types of information. Okay, so to wrap up, we want to reiterate that our goals in creating this resource is to have an iterative tool designed for adaptation and reuse. We hope that participants feel empowered to use the toolkit to build their own lessons about the causes of and potential solutions to online misinformation. If you do use the toolkit, please consider providing feedback. As a form of assessment, we created a brief survey for the instructors who use the toolkit. It's just six questions asking about instructor familiarity with teaching concepts and misinformation, whether they found the toolkit useful, as well as any general feedback. We hope that instructors do provide feedback as we do want to make improvements to the toolkit so that it you know, is a useful tool into the future. So give us a shout via the feedback form if you wind up using it. And thank you all so much for sticking with us through this last lightning session. Um, it's been wonderful to present for you. Thank you so much. Thank you all to our lightning talk presenters. Those were amazing. I really enjoyed them. Um, as Cheryl mentioned in the chat, we have about five minutes for our Q&A. So please feel free to use the Q&A feature to submit a question. Um, and actually I can turn on um, chat if people wanna drop something in the chat or say thank you to any of our, any and all of our presenters. I actually have a question for Liz. Can I ask it? Sure. Um, Liz, I'm really curious because I've been sort of following some of the efforts to get um, Library of Congress subject headings changed and the challenges inherent in doing that. And I'm wondering if you or anyone that you work with have considered 
submitting or have already done so to um, petition for change and some subject headings? Um, I will be honest, I have not. I found that article probably like a week and a half, two weeks ago. Um, so I just haven't had time to think about it. I know that, you know, individual libraries often take on um, projects where they kind of add their own localized subject headings and things like that. Um, my institution has done things like that, but not around this issue of fatness. Um, so it's definitely something I want to kind of work with them on. Um, I'm not a cataloger. I don't do cataloging. So um, I would likely probably talk with my folks here at my institution to start and then see if they would take it up the chain as they know yeah. more of those processes. But but yeah, I haven't seen anything um, like kind of overall. And that article, like I said, came out in 2012. Um, so it's kind of interesting that there hasn't been that much done about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a fairly, it's, it's a very involved process. So yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. I understand that part completely. Yeah. It is interesting yeah. too, looking at controlled vocabulary of databases and how mm -hmm. um, I think psych info recently added one like obesity added to its towards and it was like added in 2021 and I was like but that's still problematic like that's still a problematic way of describing what you're talking about um so yeah. there's still you know some of those they where they change more regularly might be a good place to start too mm -hmm. thank you And it looks like um, for our last group, um, she asked, do you address students that think misinformation is only an issue for others? I've noticed a not me attitude towards misinformation lessons from some students, which can be difficult to break through. Thank you so much for that question. Yes, we absolutely do. Um, and one of the slideshows for the learning outcomes. Um, and and this, I should say too that this toolkit is based on several workshops that Alex and I have conducted with various classes. And we're always very uh, deliberately, um, we use the word we, you know, we describe that this isn't something that happens to other people who aren't in this privileged position um, at a school like UCLA, like it, it's universal. Um, yeah, Alex, would you add to that? Yeah, I would just reiterate that, yeah, we definitely emphasize that anyone can fall victim to it. And that's why these tools like um, lateral reading and other fact checker tools are so important. We've also got a comment. Um for April, if you saw that there are neat simulators out there that ask people to identify whether a post is real or fake, and if you'd reshare, and I find that helpful. I also came across, I can't remember what university it was from, but I was stumped on multiple uh, of the uh, scenarios, which was sort of a good check for me and a reminder. This is, this is often not easy and, and it's not easy for adults and there are tools that we can give our students to make it a little bit more manageable. Thank you for that. And so I think our presenters will be some, a few of them shared their slide deck here, but they will be available on the CLAPS um, uh, main webpage. So please check back there um, to gather all of these fabulous presentations. Yeah, yeah, we've got. I think, do we get all the questions? I think we did, right? Yes, I think we did. So I want to say thanks again to everyone for coming and for our Lightning Talk presenters. And um, hope to see you all in about 15 minutes for the closing keynote. Appreciate it. Bye, everyone. <laughs>